Uh, last year, um, Stephen Brindle was the speaker and his lecture was about how structural engineering emerged as a profession over the last 200 years. So tonight, Nina and I will be talking about how some early women in structural engineering fared over the same period. Nina will be giving you the sort of wider context and I'll be sort of dipping into research I've been doing um, over the last year into two figures of particular interest to the Institution of Structural Engineers. So before I hand over to Nina, I thought I'd better explain why I became interested in this topic um, because uh, I'm a practicing engineer, I'm not a historian. Um, and it started back in 2018. Um, and I happened to be at the unveiling of the Millicent Fawcett statue in London, which celebrated 100 years of some women and all men um, getting the vote in the UK. And then in 2019, um, another centenary, uh, the Women's Engineering Society uh, celebrated theirs. That's a picture of the three founders, I think. And then yet another centenary, um, 100 years of women in the law. Uh, also in 2019 and it suddenly the penny dropped um, all these centenaries I thought um, when might we have 100 years of women in structural engineering and how might we celebrate you know it might be nice to do something I followed quickly by the question uh, well who would we celebrate and I had to realize that I had absolutely no idea so I scooted off to the institution website, um, which also didn't actually have a huge amount of information. Um, but after, um, as I say, some research over the last few months, it turns out we have two possible uh, contenders for the title of first woman. Uh, both of them are from the 20th century. Um, here they are, Florence Taylor and Mary Irvin. Uh, but before I tell you more about them, I'll hand over to Nina and she's going to um, start the the story a little bit further back. So following from um, the theme of last year's lecture, when Stephen Brindle talked about the rise of the engineering profession as it emerged from um, a mixture of artisans, makers of various types, military officers and gentlemen doing essentially what, um, in his phrase, architects were increasingly unable to do as things became more technical. Um, I'm going to start by who is an engineer, who thinks of themselves as an engineer in this country. And for most professional engineers at the chartered level or who aspire to be chartered engineers, membership of one of the professional institutions um, is what helps them feel that they are an engineer. So these are the, the old ones, the civils, the mechanicals, yourself, the structurals and the electricals. Um, and this largely frames in this country how professional engineers define themselves. Next, please. So, but what do the public think is an engineer? Well, I'm embarrassed to say that in this country, peculiarly, um, the vast majority of the general public um, think that the chap on the right in the cartoon, the, the man with the beard and the boiler suit and the hard hat, is an engineer. An engineer is somebody who comes and fixes your car or your washing machine. Now, giving full credit to this cartoon, um, these stereotypes of engineers does include a woman. They've all got hard hats, but none of them, thank goodness, are carrying spanners or hammers. They've all got the professional uh, markers of somebody who is at the professional level. Of an engineer they've got drawings plans notebooks computers and that is actually not bad going because if you look for images of engineers online you will largely get what most of us might think of as um, men on the tools doing mechanical repairs so in terms of who people might see in uh, the popular media i've included here Dr. Gillian Holtzman from the third um, film of the Ghostbusters series. And she is actually an astro uh, a, a, a physicist, but she is a tinkerer. And a lot of people think of engineers as people who make things tinker around in their workshops. And certainly that's what she's doing. Next, please. 
So who gets portrayed as a woman engineer back in the past and now? Well, on the left, we have one of the very earliest editions of the Women's Engineering Society's magazine from the 1920s, The Woman Engineer. And here we can indeed see a woman in a boiler suit with an oily rag and an engineer's cap. And this is quite reasonable because Carla Westcott was the first woman to be licensed in America as a merchant Navy ships engineer. And indeed, hands on maintenance and repairs is what marine engineers still do to this day. Moving on a bit to the 1960s, this image in the middle, a new deal for women in engineering, comes from a trade union uh, leaflet from the Confederation of Shipbuilding and Engineering Unions when they were trying to recruit more women who worked in engineering by this image of women in a machine tool workshop. Um, and they were appealing to them because that union at the time was trying to get equal pay for equal work, which is a battle still undertaken. And on the right, we have a much more up to date image from the 2000s uh, from Crossrail's uh, publicity materials when the massive um, Crossrail project made huge and successful efforts to get both gender and ethnic diversity in the workforce from top to bottom, and was successful in recruiting uh, women into engineering roles from the manual on the tools right up to the managerial levels. However, their picture still shows people in hard hats and high vis. But these are the changing images of what an engineer might look like. Next, please. So going way back, um, into the 18th and 19th centuries. Two of the earliest women documented as having worked in engineering, but who were not engineers. So Sarah Guppy is sometimes wrongly credited with having designed bridges, which she did not do. She does have a patent for um, an aspect of uh, the design of suspension bridges, but it was never put to use. It was never sold to Thomas Telford and she never designed the Clifton Bridge. She did, however, have a patent for um, a four-poster bed that could be converted into a home gym. <laughs> um, oh, somebody's still got their mic on. Um, on the right, we have M Emily Roebling. Again, not trained as an engineer, but what we might think of as an engineer by marriage. And in the late 19th century, early 20th century, this was actually surprisingly common an intelligent woman who took an interest in her husband's work and sometimes got involved. In her case, her father-in-law, um, who designed the Brooklyn Bridge, died, and then her husband, William, got uh, the bend, got case on disease and was incapacitated, and she had to take over and complete the building of the bridge to such a, an amazing extent that, that both the funders of the bridge and the workmen on the job respected her authority as the, the site engineer, if you like. Next, please. So now we come to the thorny topic of who is a first and who is not. Well, this is never one that can be settled absolutely. But as far as um, Scotland is concerned, at any rate, and I make no apology, both Dorothy Buchanan and the next example are both from uh, members of the civil engineering community, but they largely worked on structural work. This is Dorothy Buchanan. Um, she got uh, a civil engineering degree from University of Edinburgh in 1923 and immediately went to work for Dorman Long, working on as a junior engineer, doing the stress calculations, probably with a whole room full of other junior engineers with slide rules and, and mechanical calculators. And she was doing the stresses for the Sydney Harbour Bridge, and the Dassouk Bridge and the Khartoum Bridge. Um, however, she had aspirations to become chartered, as we would put it, um, with the civils, and she needed site experience. So she got a job with Pearsons in Northern Ireland, uh, which were building the Silent Valley Reservoir in the Moorn Valley, um, for which this was a huge project. Hundreds of men were employed, um, and they had to build um, a, a village for them all to live in, which was called Watertown. Um, and it was largely um, prefab buildings like the one at the bottom. 
Um, and the building like that would have been the, the site hospital, which was run by a very eminent Irish nurse called Mark Anderson, who had seen significant service in the First World War. And Margaret and Dorothy uh, lived together at the hospital. Um, it is sometimes said that Margaret Anderson was supposed to be there partly as a chaperone for Dorothy, but um, that was not the case. And Dorothy was able to move freely on and off site throughout her time there. She then returned to Dawn Longs and worked with them for the rest of her relatively short career on other bridges. Um, in 1927, she was the first woman to become an associate of the Institute of Civil Engineers. And in 1930, she married. And as was common in those days, she retired from the profession. Next, please. So here we have a woman who was in it very much for the long haul. Molly Ferguson got her engineering degree in 1936, again from Edinburgh. And she immediately joined as a pupil uh, engineer, joined the, the Edinburgh Partnership of Blythe and Blythe, with whom she remained for her, her entire lifelong career. Um, we don't know an awful lot about what she worked on, apart from a number of bridges in Scotland, the River Leven Waterworks, the Tullis Russell Paperworks at Mark Inch, um, and various bridges around the country. Blythe and Blythe's own records are woefully incomplete, but I'm, I'm glad to say that um, in 1948, they made her the UK's first female uh, senior partner in a civil engineering company, although to say she worked entirely on structural work. And in 1957, she was the, the institution's first female fellow. Um, she much later on got an honorary doctorate. Um, she was active in the Women's Engineering Society, and as with many women um, in engineering at her level, she was also active in the Soroptimists. Next, please. We're now coming up to a much later um, career. This is Marinia Chatterton, who was um, born into a Jewish family in Europe, Mayam Znamirovska. Um, her family were Jewish and very, very sensibly sent her to Israel for her training, where she uh, got a distinction um, in her engineering degree at the Hebrew Technical Institute in Haifa. And her first job, um, which is still um, early days for um, Palestine as it was then, was with the Collective Settlements Association, and she did everything. She said it was the most amazing training. She worked on the design of bridges, water towers, assembly halls, factories, all sorts of things. And as we've heard with James Sutherland um, about his post-war experience when steel was very short and difficult to get, uh, so it was in Israel. Um, and her experience of learning about uh, reinforced concrete was the making of her future career because in 1947 she moved uh, with her husband and small child um, to south, southern Rhodesia as it was then, Zimbabwe now, where steel was similarly in short supply and she was, she got a job immediately uh, because of her experience of uh, working with reinforced concrete. She worked for a company called Lysacht Company and she was with them for 10 years um, and from 1957 onwards, um, she had her own business. Um, she designed a lot of the significant buildings of the transition from colonial southern Rhodesia to independent Zimbabwe. So she designed the National Library and Army, um, the Meikles Hotel, uh, the Harare Club, which had been the Salisbury Club, uh, Livingston House, and indeed, the, um, later on, in the 1980s, she designed this building, which is the National Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. In between times, she uh, went, when things were getting a bit in a bit of a turmoil with the independence process. Um, she and her family moved back to Britain for a while, um, and she taught at Leeds University while still keeping her business going part-time in holidays in Zimbabwe. 
So this is a woman that um, bridges the, sort of the, the early and extremely difficult days of women in engineering up into the modern era, which we can see from the type of building she was designing. Next, please. So Banger now, looking, um, uh, I was looking for women today doing interesting structural work, and I came across Barbara McCauley, who is the technical manager for the Danish Roads Directorate. And she has lead, been leading the design process for the uh, new Storstrom bridge, cable stayed bridge. Um, she's been with the design director, with the Danish Roads Directorate um, since 2009, and before that was with various other Danish groups. She had her training partly at Harriet Watt University and partly at the Danish Engineering Academy. And she's by no means the only woman at uh, such a senior position in such work, particularly with bridges. Um, Dr. Vanya Samek um, is the uh, BIM and bridges expert on the Tamina Bridge project in Switzerland, which it has the highest arch in Europe. And uh, Kerry Evans with Mock McDonnell um, is involved, pertinent to this historical talk, um, in the remedial work of the 200-year-old Menai Suspension Bridge at the moment. Next, please. So if we're looking back at how things were in the early days, it was always the case that um, men in positions of authority were allies of women trying to end engineering. And to this day, uh, the Women's Engineering Society has a special annual award for men as allies because they were definitely gatekeepers in the early times. So individuals um, often supported and mentored women engineers at a time when they often couldn't uh, get the qualifications they needed and certainly couldn't join the institutions. Uh, Colonel R.E.B. Crompton, who was an electrical engineer, um, was definitely one of these. Um, as was uh, Lanchester, who was an automobile and aero engineer. They both um, covertly um, enabled women to attend um, relevant institution lectures um, at a time when women weren't allowed to be full members in many cases. But there were also companies um, that made it their business, as we would say today, proactively to encourage women's careers in engineering. And the two standout examples of this are British Thompson Houston and Metropolitan Vickers, which both recruited women at many levels um, in engineering, gave women the opportunity to learn not only practical skills, but managerial and design skills um, and facilitated uh, opportunities that were almost impossible for them to get anywhere else at the time. Next, please. So coming back to Fiona's comment about um, the upcoming um, centenary for ISRUCD um, admitting uh, women, I was looking um, into my database of many engineering related institutions and societies of various kinds and when they first admitted women. And it's a, it's a mixed bag. So the the earliest is probably the Royal Aeronautical Society, which is probably partly because they were one of the last to get established in the first place. They never prohibited women uh, from membership. And their first woman member in 1874 was a woman called Ethel Bourne. Now, I cannot find quite why they admitted her, uh, because there's no evidence that she was particularly aeronautical. She was actually a novelist. However, more authentically, in 1899, uh, the Institute of Electrical Engineers admitted her to Ayrton after a bit of a fuffle, but she was genuinely a significant uh, electrical engineer of her period with her expertise on electric arcs. <coughs> the Royal Institute of Naval Architects uh, admitted a bunch of women as their first ladies in 1919. Rachel Parsons, who was involved in setting up the Women's Engineering Society and was a, worked in her father's shipyard. Blanche Thornycroft of the famous Thornycroft 
um, shipbuilding company um, who worked with her father. And Eile Carey, who was uh, a, 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 a naval architect um, in her own right, definitely. So jumping now to 1924, after um, some difficulties with some of their predecessor organizations, such as the institution of the Institute of Automobile Engineers, um, various people tried to join and were told um, that women weren't uh, included in the word person in their constitutions, and I'll come back to that. Um, in 1924, IMECI admitted Verena Holmes, um, who was a, a mechanical and locomotive engineer, again, very active in the Women's Engineering Society. Uh, in 1925, the Civils admitted Helen Grimshaw as their first female uh, student member. Ironically, really, because she didn't actually go on to work in that field. She became a very significant aeronautical engineer at the Royal Aircraft Establishment in Farnborough. Uh, in 1926, your very own I struck T, and I will leave all of that to Fiona for, to talk about the, the women who were admitted from 1926 onwards. The Institute of Production Engineers um, admitted their first female uh, member in 1936. And again, not somebody who was originally trained as an engineer, but Anne Gillespie Shaw, a Scotswoman, whose degree was in industrial psychology, which she put to good use um, by working for Metropolitan Vickers as um, what we would think of as an efficiency expert. And she she turned herself into a production engineer, so respected that the government uh, made great use of her talents um, in the uh, munitions work factories during the Second World War. And she had her own business from before the war right through until after, um, well into the 1960s in uh, motion study um, expertise. And coming to um, the Royal Society, not, tech, not strictly speaking an engineering body, but many famous engineers have been admitted. The oldest of the bodies on this slide and the last to admit any women, um, based on their um, getting some legal advice from a, a, a KC, a, a, a King's Council in the 1920s, it was their determination that the word person in their constitution did not include women, which was what some of the other organizations based their prohibitions on earlier. So the Royal Society, founded in 1660, did not admit any women until 1945 when they admitted two, including Catherine Lonsdale, the X-ray crystallographer. Um, so we, we see um, how things have gone in fits and starts. It hasn't always been easy, but interesting women with interesting stories have made their way onto the public arena. And I now hand back to Fiona. Um, thank you, Nina. Um, and uh, obviously that was a lightning tour through the last 200 years. Uh, so here's a sort of a, 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 a picture of, of um, all of the women that we're talking about tonight. Um, the solid whites is where we believe they were active in structural engineering and the diamonds mark where they were um, significant ch sort of changes or memberships of institutions. Um, and I'm now going to talk, as we've discussed, about the two women most relevant to the I struck T, starting with Florence Taylor. And her acting is slightly different um, because she initially was working um, as uh, an architect um, very common for the time, uh, architects and engineers. Um, and then she moved into publishing, technical publishing. So that's what um, that was really the bulk of her career. So Florence was the first woman to join the Institution of Structural Engineers in 1926 as an associate member. And she lays claim to this list of rather impressive firsts, which I'll let you just absorb. Um, really, one of the, the more impressive parts is, is this um, uh, first woman in Australia to fly a heavier than air aircraft. And this is a picture of the actual glider that she flew. That's her husband who built the glider. Um, she, he took the first flight, she took the second. 
and is clearly, you know, you've got to be made of stern stuff to fly that. Um, maybe even sterner to actually try and land it, which looks like it could be quite dangerous. Um, this is Florence uh, in the frock in the distance on a tour of the Sydney Harbour Bridge shortly before it was completed. So clearly she's doing things that weren't entirely typical for women of her time. Um, she had a 60 year career in the construction industry and her obituary credits her as being, now this is quite a long list, um, a leading feminist, qualified engineer, architect, town planner, publisher and editor of journals. So, you know, impressive, really. Uh, she was obviously a busy woman. Um, uh, she is absolutely fascinating and uh, we can't possibly do her justice tonight. So um, for those of you who want to know more, there is a biography and um, there's plenty to read in there. Tonight, I'll simply be focusing on the more engineering aspects of her story, which actually haven't been um, widely studied before now. Um, and uh, so it's it, it's a very narrow focus. There's, there's uh, you know, there's far too much to, to mention. Florence, Florence fills pages uh, of, of uh, websites and, and books. Um, so this is her in 1926, the same year that she joined the Eistruck team. Um, and I saw this photograph and this elegant woman and I, I frankly assumed that she had been born with a silver spoon in her mouth, you know, all the stories about firsts, she sounds terribly impressive, but she was actually born into a working class family in Bristol in the UK and she emigrated to Australia with her family when she was five. Now, both of her parents um, died when she was in her teens, and by the time she was 19, she was living in Sydney, um, the eldest um, uh, child looking, looking after two younger sisters. And at that time, uh, frankly, a young woman with her background would have had fairly poor prospects involving domestic service. And clearly something happened to turn that around, and that was probably down to meeting uh, this man, Francis Ernest Stowe, as Nina said, um, mentors are key, key figures often in uh, women's careers. And um, this, this chap appears at numerous key points in Florence's story. Um, she actually had a very carefully curated public persona. Uh, eventually, you know, she, she created quite a, a specific image um, and she liked to give the impression that he was a family friend. But um, his papers say that he met her on a train one night um, when she was crying and um, they, they obviously got talking um, and eventually she ended up working in his office um, as a secretary. Now Stowe had a busy architectural practice and a huge variety of work from houses to major projects. There are two projects here just out of a selection that show that he was the archetypal architect engineer of the age. On the left hand side, it was a competition entry in 1922 for the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Obviously, that wasn't the one that was selected. Uh, but on the right hand side, um, this was a built scheme, very sophisticated um, coal handling depot at Balls Head in Sydney, um, handling 200 tonnes of coal per um, hour. I keep trying to say day because the, the, the amount is so enormous that it's 200 tonnes of coal per hour we're going through this. Um, and it's now a heritage site and being conserved by Sydney Council. Um, Stowe called himself an architect, but clearly there's a lot of engineering content here. Um, and while Florence was working as a secretary in his office, she discovered that the draftsman earned three times what she did. Um, and so initially, it seems, um, her move into architecture was um, financially motivated. And within a year of meeting Stowe, uh, she was working as an architectural apprentice in the offices of Edward Garton. And she was taking evening classes here at the Sydney Technical College. This is a postcard of the college from around that time. There are four women hidden in the middle of that photograph. I like to think she might be one of them. Um, and by 1904, she'd completed all of the modules for an architecture diploma. And that meant that she was the first woman in Australia to complete a full architectural training course. Um, in other parts of the world, there were a few um, earlier uh, women, but she was, she was very much in that sort of first wave um, to be going through a formal training. And from our perspective in the 21st century, that story of woman goes to college sounds quite mundane, but actually it's 
it's absolutely extraordinary you know for starters um to get onto a course at the technical college um that usually relied on having a job in your sphere or being articled um, or having an apprenticeship that is and to become articled you would need industry contacts and a hefty down payment um you would have to pay your three or four four years wages up front to your employer. So that's about £14,000, I think, in today's money. And um, Florence never publicly acknowledged this, but it really seems impossible given the timing and her other situation that Stowe wasn't somehow involved in um, these arrangements, either with making contacts or lending her the money or, you know, or, you know helping in some way. We won't know, but um, a, a fantastic transformation. This is her about that time, 1905. Um, the projects in Gant's practice seem to have been uh, domestic and small scale. This is a drawing from their office from around that time. It ties in well with Florence's descriptions of her work. Um, uh, and it's obviously difficult to tie a junior member of a practice to, to the, the projects that um, are publicised. So it's, it's the same today as it was then. Um, so we, we don't have many examples of her actual work attributed to her. She worked with Garten just long enough to complete her articles. She, she did write later that she found some of her colleagues rather unfriendly, um, but she enjoyed it better uh, when she moved to a larger practice uh, with uh, Bertram Clamp, uh, the architect, where she claims to have ended up being the chief draftsman um, in an office of 40, uh, she liked to say, male draftsmen. Um, so it, it seems there wasn't a huge engineering component to her architectural work, uh, but by 1907 she'd worked on over 40 projects and applied to become a member of the Institute of Architects of New South Wales. Um, unfortunately, they weren't so happy about that and um, her application was rejected. Um, she, she remained very bitter about, about that. She suspected that sexism was involved. Um, which it might have been. There are other administrative issues and there were quite a lot of men who weren't happy with the application process either. So, um, you know, we, we're, we can't be sure um, what the reason was that she didn't get in. Uh, but 1907 was uh, a big turning point generally. She uh, had been introduced to a friend of Stowe, again, uh, his friend George Taylor, she married him in 1907 and together they launched a publishing company and her career pivoted away from architecture and into technical publishing. And she's by far um, best known for her publishing work. Um, Building Magazine was continuously in print for over 50 years. And this is a selection of covers that show how the magazine evolved over time. It's a really invaluable historical um, archive and record of construction in Australia in the first half of the 20th century. If there was something worth writing about, it was in this magazine. And the entire back catalogue has been digitised and is available online for anyone who wants to uh, dig into it. So through her writing and editorial pieces, um, she had weekly editorials. Um, Florence became one of Australia's leading opinion formers on architecture and planning, very influential figure in the construction industry in Australia. And she begins to, um, in, in the sort of, as, as her career is, is more established, she begins to seek recognition for this um, through membership of lots of different societies. Um, and I suppose it was what Nina was um, touching on, you know, what um, defines people, gives them more authority. Um, she took this rather seriously and ended up as a member of over 50 um, institutes and societies by the time she uh, retired. Um, this is all generally happening in the green shaded part here towards the end of her journalism uh, career. I'm going to flick through this quite quickly. There's lots and lots of information in this, but um, these are a list of just the post nominals which relate to the construction industry. Um, and you can see here she has an OBE and uh, later a CBE citing her as engineer. We can see that she's joining um, uh, architectural uh, institutions, the RIBA in London, and she also finally was accepted um, in 1920 um, to the Australian 
um, Institute. Um, it was then a different name. And um, we can see she's joining engineering societies, um, the ISTRUCT and uh, the Society of Engineers, now known as the Institute of Engineering and Technology, um, based in London. She was never a member of Engineers Australia. And so all of these things are happening around about the same time. So we can assume that her membership was um, probably for the same reasons in, in all of them. This is a magazine um, a newspaper cutting, which gives us a clue. It's very difficult to read, so I'll read it out to you. Um, she was a member of the Institute of Architects, or accepted as a member finally, uh, for having practised as an architect and at present is serving in an advisory capacity to architects, as well as assisting in the production of Building Magazine. So plenty of evidence then that Florence was an architect and a journalist, but what are these citations about her being an engineer? More elusive. Um, there's no uh, this is where the trail goes a bit cold. Um, there are no engineer rec engineering records for her at the Sydney Technical College or the University of Sydney or Engineers Australia. But she left this clue in an autobiographical essay mentioning an, um, a technical college, marine engineering. And this sort of curious um, statement at the end, which never went to sea, which I thought was really slightly strange, but made sense when I found this article of this advert for a private college, college um, run by um, her friend Stowe. Um, and that college offered correspondence courses to engineers in the Merchant Navy. And it seems highly likely that she completed a short course in marine engineering about 1907. So um, that would have not really equipped her or anyone else really um, as a ship's engineer without a lot more training. So without undermining her many accomplishments, it seems a bit much to claim she trained as an engineer and maybe it's probably fairer to say she undertook some engineering training. That is still remarkable for a woman at that time. And Florence was clearly very knowledgeable about engineering and construction and she was a great support to the profession. But if you think back to why I was interested in this topic, which is to find a kind of figurehead in relation to celebrating um, women in structural engineering, she's not a great fit. It's sort of slightly difficult. Um, she's, she's not a practicing engineer. Um, and for that, we have to sort of leap forward um, to 1947 to Mary Lindsay. Um, well, Mary Irvin, uh, I've used her uh, married name here slightly by mistake, uh, but it does give me the opportunity to, to say that I did struggle to know what to call her, um, as is the convention uh, still for many women getting married, uh, change from their maiden name to their married name. Um, Mary practiced under both her names, um, but I had to choose one. And in the end, I plumped for her maiden name because that's what she was called when she joined the Institution of Structural Engineers and was most notable, I suppose, to us. So, um, as I say, Mary passed the entrance exam in 1947 to become the first chartered woman engineer and uh, at the Institution of Structural Engineers. Uh, she worked in the construction industry for over 50 years and she specialised in the design of steel work. And um, there's a wonderful insight uh, from her family that she was very petite and she liked to wear uh, towering stiletto heels to um, to make up for this. I think it's just such a fabulous image and not at all what we think of um, when we think of engineers. Um, she was born in Glasgow in 1919 to a working class family in one of these tenements um, on the Crow Road. Her father was an engineer involved in railways and light rolling stock and when she was two the family moved to Leeds, probably following her father's work um, and from census records, it, it seems that he very likely that he was working for a, uh, uh, an international supplier of light railway equipment, uh, Robert Hudson Limited in Gildeson. Um, by the time she was 20, um, she was working as a junior draftsman, uh, very possibly in an office, something like this one. Uh, she actually originally had started out in architecture, but after a trip to the steelworks, she switched to structural engineering and didn't look back. Um, her early studies were at Bradford Technical College, which is now the University of Bradford. But at age 27, 
she registered at the Royal Technical College in Glasgow, which is now the University of Strathclyde. Um, and she passed evening classes in structures and structural design with flying colours. Almost immediately, she sat the iStruct exam uh, in July of, of the same year. And there you can see her the little arrow at the bottom um, list in the list. Um, everyone who's passed the exam is on a list like this. Um, at the time, the exam was a rather gruelling two day affair, which sounds um, difficult. Um, after passing the exam, she moved um, almost immediately, really, from Leeds to work in London. Um, and this is a newspaper notice of her engagement from 1953, um, which tantalisingly tells us she was working for London County Council. But we've got no idea what she was working on. And that is unfortunately a theme which um, continues throughout her um, her career because we have lists of dates and addresses and sometimes we have companies, um, but we are left wondering exactly what she might have been doing in, in those times. So if anyone has any information or links to these companies past or present, um, we'd love to hear from you because um, it'd be lovely to get a bit more information about her projects. You'll notice she has two stints there in Africa, uh, one in southern Rhodesia um, in the 50s, and then she had a two year sort of secondment um, to South Africa in the 70s. Um, this is Mary with her husband, uh, Tom, in Kenya about 1960. She had initially followed Tom to Africa for his work, but they didn't have children and she worked as an engineer throughout their stay. Uh, I, I quite like the, the information that we we got, which was that um, they had very modern domestic ar arrangements, um, possibly because um, Mary was 12 when her mother died. She couldn't cook. And so Tom was actually the, the homemaker of the pair, although he also worked full time. Um, they returned to the UK in the um, uh, 60s to London and Mary worked there for Taylor Woodrow. And then in the 70s, she was working um, in Leeds for uh, uh, Bradshaw, Buckton and Tongue, which is now uh, better known as, as the Leeds office of Waterman. Um, and her projects then included steel framed buildings, including shopping centres, industrial buildings and power plants. And I, I love this picture because, you know, she has a set square, her calc pad, her calculator, her computer. She's got all the tools there of a modern engineer. The one project we're absolutely certain that she worked on was Castle Peak B Power Station in Hong Kong from 1981. Uh, the client was Babcock Power and uh, Cleveland Bridge was the um, steelwork contractor. And I was able to speak to one of her former colleagues who said that um, she was an extremely talented structural engineer and a pleasure to work with. She developed computer programs for the design of plate girders and design checks on coal bunkers and boiler houses. Now, um, I'm sure someone's going to correct me um, later, but I believe that these four um, um, units here are the coal bunkers and that these four are the boiler houses. So do let me know if I've got that wrong. Um, and Quite fantastically, each boiler house contained approximately 9,000 tonnes of steelwork, um, far larger than anything I work on, uh, just in, in one small part of that huge project. Um, Mary, uh, as we say, had a 50-year career and eventually retired from engineering in 19, 1985 um, uh, to St Andrews in Scotland. Um, so here we are, we have our two first women of the Institution of Structural Engineers. It's been a real pleasure to uncover their stories. Um, and hopefully there's more to be found out in the future, especially about Mary. Um, it would be nice to talk at some point about celebrating their institution anniversaries. Mary's 75th anniversary will actually be next year and Florence's centenary will be in 2026. So hopefully that's inspired some of you to research some other firsts um, that maybe will ins inspire you. There are lots of wonderful stories that are often um, tucked away and it would be nice to hear more stories uh, from individuals. Um, so now all really that's left to say is, is thank you to all the people who've helped over the last year. Um, I have a special mention for uh, Jean Cobb. Um, hello, Mum and uh, for Ginny and Fiona Lindsay and John Crankshaw 
uh, collectively their input just um, was fantastic and, and led to some really significant leaps in our research uh, into Mary. Um, and if you want to study this list more carefully, um, do come back and view the recording. Uh, we have to move on now, but um, the recording will be available about the first week of July. Um, lastly, I've been asked to mention that although there'll be time for some questions uh, tonight, a follow up discussion has been arranged for the 7th of July. Um, in the resources tab in Workcast, you'll find a link. Um, there are limited places and you will need to register in advance to have access to the session. Um, there are also our contact details here. Uh, please do get in touch about anything in tonight's lecture um, or um, with any questions, particularly difficult ones, we might have to look up the answers to um, in advance of the 7th. Um, and I'll now hand you back to Jane, who's um, in charge of tonight's Q&A. Right, we've had uh, a few questions come in, so please do keep uh, typing them in um, as, we're, as we're talking. And I think we'll, um, the first was actually a comment from, from uh, Philip Frampton, who's noted that originally engineers in the UK were trained as mechanics and people on the tools. And this image has really stuck with the British public. Whilst in Europe, um, it's always been assumed that the engineer was in fact a scientist or technologist. And I think we, we see that, don't we, with the... Um, the, the, just that different respect and recognition that is publicly available. So thank you very much, Philip, for that uh, that comment. And now here's one to, to get you um, thinking again from Alexander uh, Robertson. And he said, there's a great, uh, there are great examples of uh, notary women in engineering from the past. And his question uh, is uh, to each of you and hope you'll come up with a different answer on this. Um, who would your most uh, notary women in engineering at present be and why? Um, <laughs> i just see Fiona, I think you're looking as if you might be ready to answer that one first. Oh, crumbs. Um, well, oh, that's so difficult. I mean, that would be like me saying to um, Alexander, who's your, who's your most notable uh, Male engineer, um, so many to choose from. Um, I suppose um, I'd have to say Jane Worthing, really, just because um, you know she um, has done some fantastic work, and uh, although she's uh, retired now, she um, set up her own practice, and she, you know she's a great inspiration. So I would say Jane. Thank you, and of course there's uh, Joe De Silva, who um, was awarded the gold medal. I should know this, it was um, two or three years ago, I think. Yeah. And I remember going to her, her um, gold medal lecture, which was absolutely fantastic. Nina, have you got anybody that comes to mind immediately? Um, well, no, and I'm going to punt this back in a sense. Um, the, my motivation for doing this kind of research into the interesting stories of women who worked in engineering is to um, widen the general public's concept of who yeah. gets to do engineering. Um, and in that regard, picking the great and the good is all very well, but very few of us are going to be astronauts, as it were. Um, and if you think about um, the young, you know, the boys and girls at school, if you offer them only the role models of the people who are, if you like, the stars of today, it might seem so unattainable as not to even be worth the effort. Uh, so I think a range of um, interesting stories rather than, you know, top, top male or female person in such a field of engineering, I think is actually quite important. You want to offer interest stories about interesting men and women who have had careers on the tools, as experienced skilled technicians, as professionals, um, in a, order to make the possibilities more open um, and I, I particularly in structural engineering which um, apart from this lecture I haven't done an awful lot of research into I would be really hard pressed to pick even a handful never mind one or two um, stars of today. 
Yes, thank you. I, I think what you're saying there, uh, Nina, with regard to the, um, I can say almost it's okay to be not ordinary, but to be, um, I guess, not not of an absolute superstar, um, is can make it more attainable, can't it, for for girls to feel that they can come into the industry. Well, and I mean, we're told that there's a shortage of any kind of person. So, you know, oh, right. this, this applies this applies to boys as well as girls. If you want to make engineering seem interesting, you have to offer a range of interesting stories. Yes, I, I think you're, you're quite right there. And obviously, if, even if people do want to see it, just do my little plug here for the institution website, there are various profiles of uh, people at different, um, different stages of their career, different types of... Um, interest and it's it's a very good resource when trying to encourage youngsters if anybody wants to find it on the website i can't tell you immediately where it is i should probably be able to but uh, do contact uh, headquarters and somebody will be able to point you in the right direction to to help you uh, find find those um that that, that resource i think it's Something that really struck me um, that um, you said, Fiona, was about the, the need for mentors and just how valuable that is. And obviously it was essential back back then that to actually have uh, mentors now is equally important, I think, to encourage people and to, to bring them in and to keep them staying with the, um, with the industry. Uh, I don't know if you've got any more to say on that, Fiona, but just if I could just ask you, could you try and turn your microphone up just a bit? It's not it's, it's uh, too low. It's it's a bit uh, a bit low, and I think even though it is going to be um, uh, it's going, going to be uh, available as a recording later, it might be quite helpful if it was a touch louder. So sorry, sorry. Go, going back. That oh, that's better. That's better. <laughs> Mentors, yes. Oh, um, I suppose um, there's. There's two things that occur to me about that. I mean, I think I think um, for for any young engineer, I, I don't I don't think you should really peg this on um, either gender. Really, mm. any young engineer really needs somebody to kind of fight their corner or you know look out for them. Um, uh, and then there's I suppose an interesting thing that's developed recently, which is that people seem to, I mean, obviously, when I started, there really there wasn't a lot of choice, so it wasn't something that occurred to me that I needed to have somebody to look to. Um, and so I think I'd probably say, you know, to people to keep an open mind about who they think of as mentors. It, you know, it's it's not, it, you know, people of all shape and size and uh, are relevant as role models. Um, and not to be pegged to thinking, oh, it's got to be someone that looks like me. I mean, it, it does help, mm. um, but it's not um, It's not always practical to do that, is it? Uh, you know, no, you can learn things from all sorts of people, and, and that's that's the way you should, I think, approach it. Yes, yes, I, I think I'd very much mm. say the same. I, I, would, I would also say that I, I've never done mentoring on either side of the table myself, but people who are ment mentors and mentees both sides say they gain from it. The mentor gains as well as the mentee, um, which I think, you know, is, is worth mentioning for those people who have not yet been um, asked to, to become involved in yeah. mentoring. That's a really, really valid comment. Thank you. Um, there's a, a, a comment from Sarah Buck, who, of course, was our first uh, female president of the Institution of Structural Engineers. And that was in our centenary year back in 2008. And Sarah has just uh, added the comment that she thinks it's an excellent idea to celebrate the 75th and 100th anniversaries. And that during her presidential year, she saw an exhibition about Florence Mary Taylor in Australia. And she also met uh, Marjorie Chatterton, who was a truly inspirational engineer. And that was in 2008. And it would be good to see if any, it'd be good if any celebration was not just at the institution, but targeted at a wider audience. That's a, another really useful um, thought. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, Chris uh, uh, Burgoyne from um, University of Cambridge has just asked a question. What about Letitia, Letitia Chitty? Chitty. 
Mm. Yeah, for, first uh, Cambridge graduate in engineering in mechanical sciences. Um, she worked on aircraft and airships in the 1920s and 30s and also worked at Imperial College from 1934, civil engineering, and was the first female, um, sorry, first, first female fellow of the Royal Aero Society and was active until her 80s. So Nina, is there any more that you'd like to add about? Well, she, she's a great example. I mean, you didn't allow us a three hour talk or we, we could have done know. a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Letitia Chitty is very interesting. Um, Yes, yeah, she started off um, a bit like Helen Grimshaw, who I mentioned fleetingly, at Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough. Um, one of the early um, interwar intake of women who had got uh, degrees mostly in maths, but also in engineering from, from Oxbridge and were, de were proactively recruited to into Farnborough. Um, and but as, as um, was said, she um, she. Uh, left her work there and took her structural expertise to Imperial. Um, I think they still have a, a prize in her name. Um, and uh, I think um, a room I'm forgetting now. But yes, another very interesting person. Um, and, you know, if we think about structures, we've been talking largely about structures in the kind of architectural and civil engineering sense. But actually, people working on structures more generally work in aeronautical engineering, in naval architecture. Um, you know, it's not just buildings, bridges and dams. Yeah. That's great. Andrew, you're, you're obviously sitting there very patient. I wonder if there's anything that you have that you'd like to ask uh, Nina or uh, Fiona having had the opportunity to listen through their, their lecture this evening. I, I was going to ask, um, how has the number of female uh, women uh, chartered engineers changed over time? And what sort of proportion does it reach now? For instance, I know that in architecture, there's, there's really quite a high proportion of women who've become professionally qualified and practised. Engineering, I guess, is lagging quite a long way behind, but how are we doing? Um, well, I can't. Do, do, do you know for the structurals um, what, what the numbers are like? Oh. No. Well, oh, typically uh, it varies a lot from field to field. So um, civils and aero and electricals, there tend to be more women in those than in other fields, especially um low numbers in mechanical um in engineering as a whole women are as they've always been um clustered in the defense industries and in aerospace and that's been that's been true since the interwar period and it's still true as for chartered chartered numbers i don't know it's a good question though and definitely worth finding out i don't the numbers creep up really slowly um, and I, I have behind me um, on the shelf a long roll of paper which I put together as a kind of very lengthy spreadsheet of government initiatives to get women into engineering in the last hundred years as compared to the statistics of the numbers actually doing so and it doesn't make cheer, cheering reading um, particularly when you, you compare um, the, the numbers of Women in engineering in this country compared to other countries across the world, and we're still we're still miles behind almost everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We, we've actually had a um, a response in there from Margaret Cook saying seven point four percent chartered. Um, so thank thanks Margaret for that. And I think one of the things we are going to see is that that number is going to increase quite quite rapidly, um, because when you look at the at the student graduate end. The, the, num the percentage has in increased enormously over recent years. And as they work through the pipeline, that will hopefully improve. Um, but well, you, you, you need to use some duct tape on that pipeline to make sure they don't escape. Uh, yes, yeah. Male and female, actually. I'm <laughs> we sure. Need to, we need oh. to keep them all. <laughs> well, having, having said that, any engineering education, regardless of whether you continue to work in engineering, is never a waste. 
you know, if they go off to be uh, you know, accountants or something, that means that that accountancy firm um, has a much better educated workforce as regards asking the right technical questions. Yes. Ne never lost. Yeah. And uh, Margaret's added a, another couple of uh, statistics here. 25% uh, students, I think that's a female. Um, and she said, but I, I struck T or I, because obviously, yes, it's obviously the, the, the time lag that we were, we're just mentioning there. Uh, now, Lindsay uh, Krisnick is saying, of those women who get chartered, how many stay in the profession, perhaps after having families? And are most women who are staying in the profession without children? I have no idea whether any statistics are being gathered on that. Um, probably not. Probably, probably not. Um, I don't know. That might not be entirely legally correct to ask. I pro know. Probably not, Fiona. Yes, I do do remember one awful um, interview when I was asked if I was planning to have a family, which was... Um, totally Bit, incorrect yeah, to be asking <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, right so moving on uh, Sarah uh, Buck has, uh, has noted that we did used to have an aeronautical question in the, the Struts exam uh, mm. so thank you Sarah yes that was a, a bit back wasn't it and Richard uh, Dawson um, said there was a lady structural engineer who doesn't recall her name on a BBC repair shop and her her briefcase was being mended. It might be looking back at uh, looking back at uh, BBC iPlayer. I, she I said think she came up on on Twitter. That, yeah. Um, uh, it, she, I think that she'd mentioned she was the first. Woman. One of the first, it says here. Yes. Oh, one of them. So yeah, yes, I haven't seen the footage myself, but uh, it, I did. I did see that, and I think that. Um, Someone from the Astrocy had tweeted back to say they thought maybe not the first. <laughs> Clearly. But an, old, an older lady anyway, yeah. presumably. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. So it'd be interesting to find out who she was. It would, it yeah, would, yeah, some, it would. Yeah. Somebody's job to have a look at that. Um, <laughs> and then mo moving on, the, um, more women do leave. Um, probably than men so mentoring does become absolutely essential but I think again as as you mentioned before um, Nina that perhaps the it's having the right person mentoring or so it might have been Fiona the right person as opposed to necessarily being somebody who looks like me I don't know I mean I, I had some fantastic uh, mentors over the early years of my career and not one of them looked like me but they they were excellent I'm so grateful to the the role they had in in my um, my career, uh, right. Just quickly whizzing through the question. Uh, Sarah Sarah also wrote. Sarah Buck uh, wrote to the repair shop to get more information, but she didn't get a reply. <laughs> and Margaret has commented that uh, there's no stats on how how many women stay after having children, but once chartered women, but once chartered women do tend to stay in the profession. Um, so once they're in, they do tend to stick. So maybe that's something which we, we do need to um, think about in that it's, it's good to get them on that route to chartership as soon as we can do. And Sarah has come back and said, Betty Dillon. Was that, Sarah, was that the Betty Dillon who was on Repair Shop? Uh, Juliana Stovall has said that an interesting statistic published by ASCE in 2018 said that studies showed that only 14% of the civil engineering work workforce was comprised of women. About 40% of women have engineering degree, who have engineering degrees never enter the workforce or drop out, which is a high percentage, isn't it? So let's hope that we can improve that and change some minds and Sarah has confirmed it was Betty Dillon who was on a uh, repair shop so we'll have to so get is that is that D-I-L-L-O-N correct yes yeah okay so we'll uh, leave we you can... with that one so you, you yeah. can look that up before the uh, before see. the discussion group yeah see if I 
Good fun, Which, isn't it? Yeah, um, well, that, that just brings me I to... Mean, think, think, thinking about the impossibly illegal question on having children, um, about um, 12, maybe longer years ago, um, the United Nations did a survey, a global survey, of um, how women in the percentage of women in engineering in different countries and how they manage their careers and work-life balance and all the rest of it. And the outcome of that was that the countries with the most women engineers were those where there was a tradition of cheap domestic servants. Right. Yeah. Mm. Because that, that's how they manage their work-life balance is by having somebody else do it. Well, there was a uh, great uh, viewpoint article in the in the magazine a couple of weeks ago from Margaret Cook, um, which did talk a little bit about the work-life balances, I think. Um, I thought that's a, a lovely article. Thank you um, to Margaret for that. Yeah. Well, I when I was, interviewing, I was interviewing Syrian um, engineers for that survey, yeah. and I asked, I asked the women about, because uh, about 40% of engineers in Syria are women, and I asked them about work-life balance, and they looked blankly back at me and had no idea what I meant. So I explained, you know, fetching the kids from school, feeding everybody, looking after the house, and they said, "We have servants. What do you do?" <laughs> <laughs> right. Gosh. Yeah. There you go. I mean, it's interesting that that parallel, um, you know, because Florence uh, Taylor and uh, Mary Irvin, they both. Um, uh, were teenagers uh, when their mothers died and uh, it did really strike me that perhaps that had allowed them a rather unconventional upbringing. Um, yeah. or, or well, also, they, also they, Mary, 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 Mary Lindsay and Marinia Chatterton both lived in co late colonial Africa um, and Marinia was quite open, you know, the fact was that um, she had servants look after the kids, otherwise she could never have done anything. Yeah. Well, so Sarah's actually um, come back and pointed out that in Poland it's about 50-50, which is yeah. re really good statistic there. 